Cliff is a USAT level two coach and he's had type one diabetes since the age of nine. Uh, Cliff has completed 17 Ironman triathlons and I did the math, that's 2,380 miles of running, biking, and swimming just in those events. And that he is not, hasn't just completed events, he is a world record holder for both the Ironman and the half Ironman distances. Wow, that's world that's record holder. For type one? Not just type one, everybody. As is type, type one. <laughs> type one. I wish, well, but yeah, as type one, yeah. He's founder of his own company, TristarAthletes.com, and he uh, works as an endurance athletic specialist and coach. And he's also a self-confessed gadget physiologist. So let me turn things over. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. How's everybody doing? Can uh, everybody hear me all right? All right. Thanks, Gary, for the uh, great introduction. And uh, John, uh, where is John here too? Um, love to be, uh, I'm so happy to be a part of this track with you guys uh, this afternoon. And special thanks to um, Insulin Independence for bringing me out here and uh, sharing with you my, uh, my geek and data story. Um, please feel free at, at any time during the, uh, the talk here to just raise your hand if something doesn't make sense. Um, I tend to rifle through things pretty quickly that I gloss over a few things that you guys may not know that I know, for instance. So, um, yeah, a little bit more about me. Um, I have been racing for quite a few years. Um, I love triathlon. Uh, it's a lifestyle for me. Swimmer, biker, runner. I've uh, been active for um, my entire life. Uh, I have a real hard time sitting still. And um, basically, um, my day-to-day -day job is working with um, not type 1 diabetic athletes for the most part, but um, regular athletes. Um, and then it's growing on, on the type 1 side uh, the more I meet uh, different folks. Um, but uh, I work out of uh, Tricer Athletes Lab, which is in Norwalk, Connecticut. And we do physiological testing there and uh, a lot of remote coaching um, via the web. So, let's see. How many of you know of Iron Man Hawaii? Vic's been there. Vic is one of my uh, very astute and good students and fast students. And Vic did Hawaii, uh, was it it's 2011? 2011, yep. Yep, that was a great race for Vic. So I don't really like talking so much about my flair. I'm gonna try and move on a little past me uh, and talk more about the gadgets. Um, there are uh, a little more about me, I guess. I will start there. But um, I am a pro coach, um, as Gary mentioned, a fast guy. Um, a little, some pictures about what I do here. So what I wanted to really cover for you guys is why do you use gadgets? What do you use them for? And how do you apply them to your diabetes on a daily basis? Because there is so much data, you could just sit there like I do all day long and stare at it and it won't come to you. Um, but if you have a little bit more insight as to um, what you're supposed to be looking for, um, there are some great apps, great pieces of technology that can do a lot, a lot of stuff for you. So I'm going to start off with the Garmin devices. How many uh, people have a GPS tracking device? Wow. All right. How many of you have one of these, these guys up here that are on the screen? Okay, great. And how many of you actually upload to the web? And how many of you actually look at what you put up on the web? <laughs> okay, all right. I find that that's a very much higher compliance rate than my traditional athletes, by the way. So kudos to you guys. So uh, with the Garmin units, obviously the, the best thing that you get for these, um, they, they are expensive, but they're pretty robust. So compared to iPhone things, um, you know, they're all conditions. You can take them in the water. The Garmin 910 here is the coach when uh, the coach is away. You can take it swimming, biking, running. It measures power. It measures pace, elevation, temperature, 
if the coffee pot is on, you name it. I mean, it really does it all. So what's the most important thing? Um, heart rate functionality. Um, being able to get consistent heart rate information on there. And we'll, we'll elaborate more in the presentation on what that means and how you use it. Um, but the ability to upload this stuff. Uh, so how Garmin is pretty open about that. You, they upload to their own website, but at the same time, you know, you can push this data just about anywhere um, for more analysis, which is fantastic. So I'm going to be only covering the Garmin units. Obviously, there's TomTom Tom and uh, a few other uh, uh, products out there for, for GPS stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> nowadays, a lot of people are really training for the data. <laughs> there's some people who are, are not that motivated, uh, even for the workout, I find. They're, they're like, you know, oh, man. My watch crapped out halfway through my run, and I didn't get any of the data. I can't give you anything. Like, well, you got the benefit of the workout. It, you, you got it. It's, it's all good. Um, next up is um, obviously the, the iPhone and uh, any uh, mobile device uh, is going to have. Uh, there are so many apps nowadays. I, I look through the App Store all the time, and it's just a new one pops up. Um, there's not even enough time for me to experiment with them all. I'm just going to touch on some of the ones that I, I like the most. Um, so iPhone app uh, Wahoo. Uh, Wahoo has a whole bunch of great products. It works either Bluetooth or AMP Plus enabled. Uh, it has its own app, uh, the heart rate strap. So these are all AMP Plus enabled pieces up here, including you've got uh, FootPod here. Uh, this is an AMP Plus enabled strap, not a Bluetooth one. Uh, let's see here. So that is uh, an AMP Plus dongle on the bottom of the iPhone that helps receive the information, again from the foot pod or heart rate. And it also takes GPS uh, and it's capturing a lot of information. Now, there are cases. This is uh, a case also made by Wahoo that has the AMP Plus key in the bottom. And so this one is actually made for biking, so it's waterproof, which is really nice, obviously. And uh, it's a great product. It works really well. And the nice part about uh, what they do with the apps and uploading that information is it goes straight to the web. There's no, you know, when you get home, let me go find information, let me download it. It's, it's already there. You can analyze it in, in real time, which is really great. And I think the future of pretty much all sport products will be that. But uh, we're still, you know, uh, waiting on Garmin to give us Wi-Fi and, and other things like that. But someday. Again, image of the foot pod. It's amazing. It's such a small piece of plastic with a little battery in it, and it's seventy dollars. Uh, I'm sure they make them for five cents, but they're, it's a great it's great to have. So with the uh, with the Wahoo app, what I really like about the Wahoo app is it has uh, heart rate distribution. So as you're working out, you can see how much time you spent in each zone, and that physiologically, there are different things that you're trying to capture uh, as an athlete. If you're trying to improve your economy, if you're trying to boost stamina, uh, each zone has its own representation of what you're trying to create uh, stress and stimulus. Uh, so for instance, zone two, which is kind of like this yellow zone here, which is very aerobic, uh, that's a fat burning zone. So less carbohydrate is being burnt. Uh, and you know you can have a test done very easily to figure out what your heart rate zones are, whether it's a field test or physiological testing um, to analyze these things. But great app, Wahoo, uh, very straightforward. Uh, the cost for all the products, I think, including the app, is about 115, 120 bucks. And uh, all the other Garmin devices here range anywhere from 100 to uh, 600, 700 bucks. So. Uh, the biggest thing I look for in, in the apps is do they play nicely? Do they play nicely with other apps? And can you upload them? And what can you do with that information? So some you know, restrict what you can do with your heart rate information. They only want to keep it on their unit. But my favorite apps that are up here are Training Peaks, which has a great back end website. Uh, that is uh, really 
the coaches and athletes preferred um, heavy duty uh, training app, if you will. And it has a lot more back end stuff for type 1 diabetes, which I'll get into, but a really nice app as well. Strava, more for kind of fun, uh, less on the, on the diabetes side of things, but uh, all these apps have some utility. Gary, you touched a little bit on this one earlier, Pancreum. Pancreum is a, is, there's like six or seven really f great apps in there. Um, I use two of them pretty, pretty regularly. One is the, um, the uh, insulin on board calculator. And this is pretty simple, but you can take uh, an insulin duration of action, the last correction, um, basically it's two boluses a basal rate, and then it'll tell you how much insulin is on board. So for those of you who don't have a pump, uh, the injection therapy, uh, you can use uh, something like this to help you figure out what, uh, what is on board, which is really important in trying to determine how much carbohydrate you want to take before you do an activity. Uh, there's a kind of quick and dirty uh, <laughs> way that I like to use uh, exercise and this app. Uh, the rule is for intensive exercise, sustained intensive exercise, um, for every unit on board there should be two times the amount of carbohydrate on board. So for instance if you're going to go uh, for a workout and you, you have three units on board and uh, one unit covers 20 grams of carbohydrate, you better have double that. And that adds up to a lot of carbohydrates. So when I see a lot of people who have lows during their workouts, they have just way too much insulin on board to start off. So this app is very helpful in trying to figure um, out where to start, um, how much to ingest. And certainly, you know, what you eat prior to a workout has a, a big impact on how your blood sugar is going to perform. But uh, the more uh, clean carbohydrates you're eating prior, question, yeah? three units on board and you take two times, so you're taking like six units worth of carbs comparatively? Exactly. Yeah, you got it. So not just 20, but you're taking six times that. 20. Right. So there's only so much the stomach can actually absorb. So, you know, if you have more than three units, four units, five units on board, and you're trying to eat a thousand calories an hour, it's not going to be pretty. You know, you should go for a run and it's not going to be pretty. You're going to walk and get low or... Um, so I, I really try and get people to look at the timing of a bolus and you know if you've got three or four units or more on board wait past an hour go at the two hour mark and we you know we have to time things as diabetics it's it's tricky when we have um, a lot of diabetic athletes together and it, some of them are saying well I need to go at the two hour mark some need to say I need to go right away and, and like this morning like some people are out of the door just running straight away but um, it, it, it's all about timing and trying to get you know what you need resource wise to cover the amount of carbohydrate that you're working with so it's a good question the other one is uh, an IC ratio calculator that I like to use it's just helpful for narrowing down uh, the IC ratio for people who are unsure of where, where it should be at different points during the day or they're just unsure of their IC ratio in general. And it's a pretty simple app. You just enter in your weight, your height, gender, and your age and it pushes back the IC ratio towards you. And then there's refinement with this, but it kind of gets you in the right zip code. Track 3 is a, a pretty, pretty cool app uh, that I experimented with for a bit. One of the things I really liked about it was that it had uh, these time periods throughout the day that you could specify very specifically and timestamp them. So you could go back and pull reports. Uh, you know, this particular time I, ha I wake up or in the morning and I always eat my breakfast at this and this time. But it has a lot of customized entries. Um, everything can be emailed, syncs across all devices. So I really liked Track 3. Um, I don't use it as much anymore. But I, I do like it quite a bit. Yeah. Hey Cliff, when you send the data from Track Three, what kind of reports or listing does it provide? I believe it's an email with a .csv file. I believe, um, at least for the the glucose part. Um, I don't know because they've done a bunch of updates since I used it the last time. But it it's pretty robust, and they've been adding to it a lot. 
and the food database is, is good in there as well. And it's probably of, of the apps that I've tried out the most customizable when it comes to um, what you can do. Yeah. Are they, are they all iPhone based or are they also Android? The Track 3 app, I don't know if it's Android based. I just don't know. Yeah. I think they are because they've grown pretty quickly. Um, but I wouldn't know. Many start out as iPhone and then they. Yeah, they branch, yeah, exactly, branch out. So, any other questions on that? The iBiker app. So this is another kind of heart rate based app that I liked a lot and I've used off and on. Uh, again, great for heart rate analysis, for uploading to multiple sites. Um, it plays very nicely. You can, you know, at the end of your workout, when you go to hit save, you can just tap four or five different websites and it just pushes it right to those sites for more analysis. Sometimes I won't go back and look at some of these uh, particular sites until, you know, I want to collectively look at more data in aggregate over time. So how many people have experimented with Fitbit or know what Fitbit is? Okay. How many of you like your Fitbit? I don't have one. Oh, you know of it. Okay. So Fitbit, um, I experimented a bit with their, it's an accelerometer that also tells you sleep. Um, you tell it when you go to sleep. It measures activity throughout the day. And what's really nice about it is if you enter the food into the app in the iPhone, what it'll do is it'll tell you if you're at goal, below goal, or over goal for what you need calorie-wise throughout the day. And it'll even tell you, and it's real time, which is pretty pretty nifty thing. Uh, so sometimes throughout the day, if I find I'm not eating enough or I have a workout in the morning, and I look at that meter and it's in the red zone, and I'm always shocked. I said, wow, I'm, I'm in the hole. 2,000 calories from that run this morning. Like, whoa. Um, so this is pretty neat. The, the, the downside, I guess, of this is, you know, you lose this, it's not very fun, not pretty, because you're kind of like, well, where am I for the day and how does this work? Uh, but it's, uh, they also have a bracelet, which is here, and this is their, their newer version, which is waterproof, and it's pretty, it's pretty good, pretty accurate. Um, in terms of the calorie counting and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think they need to improve a bit on the, the database for food, but it, it's a very functional and good app. It's similar to the Nike Fuel or some of the other apps uh, that are out there paired with um, accelerometers. And you can add custom entries. I forgot to mention that. So if you wanted to enter uh, blood glucose, or you wanted to track insulin, you could also do that as well. So, is it the Fitbit app? It's an app, and it's a website. So, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, like Training Peaks, Fitbit, the ones that I like the most are the ones that have a really good back end. So that you know, if the app crashes or something happens, you know, it, it's always syncing with the website. So you could actually be at your computer. It has um, a USB plug on the side of it. And if you're even within 20, 30 feet of it, it will pull in the information from Fitbit and put it into the website. And then when you open up your iPhone app, it actually references that first, pulls it all together, and then tells you where you are. And so I've seen on my Fitness Pal, they, they advocate Fitbit a lot. Is that doing the same thing, or is that just a different app and you have to download it? Because kind of I know they have a pretty significant food database. I don't know how it yeah, I don't know how it pairs up. Uh, so it's just a different one using the gadget. Probably, yeah. A lot of, um, th there are a lot of gadgets out there that are starting to just collect information. Uh, it's tricky to figure out which website will come out and be probably, you know, be able to accept all this in, uh, in a way that um, you can put it in one place and make sense of it. So I'm, I find that Training Piece is probably the only website that um, really has a lot of open doors as to different devices that you can upload to it, but they don't incorporate Fitbit, so, yeah. yeah. So, metabolic heart testing. This is what I do a lot um, in our lab in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut. 
you wear a Darth Vader mask, it looks kind of funky. Uh, it's really not a painful test, it's a ramp test that starts really easy and then it goes all the way to very hard, all the way to VO2 max if you want. But what's really neat about a metabolic heart test is it tells you your unique physiology. And so we capture breath by breath data where oxygen in and CO2 out produces what's called a respiratory quotient. And a respiratory quotient basically will tell you how much fat you're burning versus carbohydrate. So what we do is we pair that with an intensity, heart rate, and we use that to create heart rate zones. And we determine how efficient you are at burning fat and burning carbohydrate. And in my experience and the, the diabetic athletes that I've worked with, one of the most important drivers, especially for endurance athletes, is how depleted their glycogen storage is from burning carbohydrate. So if somebody does a very long, slow walk, they're not burning a whole lot of carbohydrate. If somebody's doing a very high intense exercise interval or for extended periods of time, their, their, um, how long they'll be sensitive to insulin is more directly correlated to how depleted they are. And that can range anywhere from recovery times, you know, 30 minutes all the way up to days. Uh, but generally speaking, the body recovers rel relatively quickly with glycogen storage. Um, it's about as fast as you can eat carbohydrate. So, um, you know, if you go and have an entire pizza pie and that's about uh, 2,000 calories worth of carb, you're pretty much getting there. So, um, the, even the leanest bodies in sport have uh, tons and tons of fat storage. So. What we're really capped by is our glycogen storage, and that's it's the gas tank. So it, the gas tank, and that is that carbohydrate, is what drives us every single day. When we walk around, uh, our brain relies on it, our visceral organs rely on it, and fat is just as it is. It's storage. Uh, so we really want to tap into that fat if we're endurance athletes, um, and as we're, as diabetics too. It's a very important uh, display with insulin. It's you know the more insulin you have on board when you go to do a workout, the more it's telling your body to burn carbohydrate. You're a sugar burner. Whereas if you want to try and lean your body out, you have to go the other way. T parse out the insulin prior to an activity so that your body actually metabolizes fat as a source of fuel. So metabolic heart testing, again, good way to figure out um, what the energy source is coming from in our bodies. We have two sources. Uh, one is unlimited. Uh, the other one, not so much. If you see somebody hit the wall in a marathon or uh, in an Ironman or a half Ironman, it's because they're out. They're out of glycogen or they haven't eaten enough. Any questions so far on that? So this is just a chart that shows by zone, heart rate zone, how we can expect uh, to metabolize what kind of energy source, fat versus carbohydrate. And as you see, as you toggle all the way up the chart from zone two, zone three, zone four, the carbohydrate demand goes up quite rapidly. So this is a sample of a test that we do in our lab. One of our tortured suspects here. When he's wearing his mask and uh, we're gonna take him all the way up to his VO2 max. And from that we'll produce his heart rate zones. Is that exercise dependent? It is. Uh, it's actually very different between running and biking. Um, not dramatically in some ways, like it depends on um, the economy of the athlete and how they run, for instance. Uh, running is all demanding in terms of using all your muscles, whereas cycling for some people, they tend to test a little bit lower in their max output, and, uh, and carbohydrate is, is probably spared a bit more because of the fact that they're just more efficient at cycling, and you're not using your upper body so, so much. So based on heart rate zones and knowing uh, carbohydrate uh, versus fat burning, um, we can suggest decreases for, uh, to baseline of uh, basal rates and describe uh, how long that should be. And so we use a lot of spreadsheet data for our athletes to give them very direct um, feedback on to, okay, well, this is a very intensive bout of exercise. Well, you can't run the same basal program that you are day in and day out. 
And the fact is, with people who get to at least higher level of training, what happens is their exercise is very cumulative. So a week's worth and even 40 days of training has an impact on what's happening today. Mostly within a week is where you see uh, the direct impact to um, insulin suppression need. So this is uh, mostly experiential data from uh, stuff that I've uh, done with our athletes. And uh, it works really nicely. Yeah? I was just wondering, uh, if you have somebody who's not on a pump, uh, do you have advice you can give them to? Get on a pump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did, I fought the pump for a long time. Uh, I, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, m many of you here probably know Paul Madden. He was the, the most influential person to, to me to get that and get that done. Um, and uh, it opened a lot of doors for me. There were, there were times where during my training, you know, I would train upwards of 40 hours in seven days. And to figure out how to lay out my shots at night, because I would eat so much, like dinner, I would just be plowing through food. I would set my alarm every two, three hours to take a bolus because I couldn't take it all at the time. And uh, Paul said to me one time of dinner, he said, you're a pump. And he said, you know, get a pump. And I said, yeah, all right, all right, all right. I don't want it. And Omnipod was great for me. It happened to work out nicely because I like to swim a lot, and that's part of triathlon. So um, but there's just so much more you can do with a pump that it's very hard for me to give uh, this kind of advice to people who are not pumping. It's almost not really possible. So, yeah. Question? Training Peaks website. This is, Vic gets emails from me all the time through this site. <laughs> His facilitated torture, right Vic? <laughs> so you log in through uh, our website or the Training Peaks website. And it, this pulls up all the information uh, GPS wise and is like a, it's a tape. It's like cue the tape, here's what happened. And I look at that and I can figure out um, kind of like Gary does with CGM stuff, what happened. So I've mentioned all this um, pretty much previously, but uh, it's again great for heart rate analysis, um, preferred by coaches and athletes. Um, GPS up, uh, uploads, every, pretty much every GPS and heart rate monitor can upload to it that has AMP Plus capability. So the real nice part is post-workout, you can analyze everything heart rate-wise, what's happened. Um, and it's nice to know power, it's nice to know pace, and it's nice to know how far we, we ran and how, how much uh, elevation gain we had and all that good stuff. But really what drives it physiologically for diabetics is glycogen storage, depletion, and heart rate. So knowing your heart rate zones is so much more critical. Uh, for, for you guys specifically. Uh, there is the app to log in workouts through that as well. And anything you push to the web will come back down to the app. And there's a few snapshots you'll get here of kind of what, what that uh, website looks like. This is a whole month uh, view of workouts. Um, by compliance, green means they were done to the letter in the spirit. Red means uh, that they either missed the workout or they went over or under. So you should go back and look at them. Um, blue is swimming. And this is again um, like a, a calendar view of different workouts. It's a pretty complex website, but really great um, for analysis. Not just for Gata Deeks like me. Get data geeks like me. So even just one singular workout has just tons and tons of data, but diving into it, when I come into this as a diabetic, I say, how much time did I spend in zone one, two, three, four, and five? What was the distribution of that heart rate? And then I usually go back and I look at the comments that people put in there and you know, they'll filter their uh, blood glucose, what they ate, and I can go back and really figure out and try and troubleshoot things. Is that um, a Training Peaks uh, graph or is that through your TriStar graph? 
Uh, like, like that calendar, is that something that you did for TriStar or training? It's it's Training Peaks website that we get to use okay. through them. We pay a license fee to, to use it. Okay. Anybody can sign up for it. There's a basic free account, and anybody who wants one, I can sign them up through my coaching account. It's free. Um, so just if you're if you're interested, just let me know. Okay. Yeah. And they also have a premium version, which has a lot more analysis and tools and gra uh, graphs for for all of the data you push up there. All right. So here is the mobile version. Again, I come back in here and I look at the heart rate piece after a workout and I'll make adjustments to basal rate based on what I'm seeing by a distribution of heart rate. This is somebody I worked with recently for Ironman Lake Placid. We went over uh, his heart rate information, um, looked at some of his last previous workouts and then gave him uh, specific insulin instructions uh, and carbohydrate to take in during the race. And this is post-race information on the right, and then this is, was his insulin plan that we put together. Uh, actually, this one was for a half in particular. But we don't leave much to the imagination. Uh, and everything is very plug and play, and, uh, and there's a reason why we do certain things. Um, in fact, you know, Gary was talking about stress earlier. Stress is a major part of racing. And uh, prior to an event, it's scary, but I have people take a lot of insulin before a major event because... He's taking 8.3 units before he's swimming. Yes. Above Into his arm. And zero basal. Zero basal. That's incredible. Yep. And at the simultaneously taking in uh, 300 calories of carbohydrate and 75 grams at the same time. You do. Okay. And then there's no insulin the rest of the race. Every distance is totally different. So I spent the early part of 150 triathlons figuring this stuff out. A lot of crash and burn, and it's really tough to watch people go through the same things that I did over and over and over again. So, I, and it takes a lot of trust for somebody to say, I'm gonna take 13 units straight <laughs> into my arm, or I'm doing my Ironman, I'm gonna take five, six units straight into my leg before you know doing a, an event. But physiologically, race day is very different than your training. It's, it's the depleted, depleted state of an athlete uh, and that sensitivity level that is so dramatically different than what you see on race day. So I, the, I'm surprised I didn't give up in my early part of my career with Ironman. That's why it took me about 17 to get decent, I call them decent, um, races from race results because I had to go and go back to the well and figure it out. And I did injection therapy for the first 10 of my races. And when I had my fastest Ironman, it basically proved to me I couldn't race any faster without a pump. And I would get to the marathon and I would be so depleted that I would only take three units of Lantus in the morning and it was too much by the time I got to the marathon. It was way too much. I was still, you know, force feeding Coke and, and uh, gels. It was just a nightmare. Yeah. One thing. That, that we've, we've noticed over the years is that if you get low in an event, even if you recover glycemically, you still can't perform at the level you would have if you didn't get low in the first place. Can't can perform. Get like cannot get perform. cannot perform. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and if you experience a low, it robs you of your ability to. Perform. It does, and that's because insulin is artificially pumped into your body in a way that the body wouldn't do it, and you get depleted. And so, you know, it was again that turning the needle towards burning glycogen with putting that much insulin in the tank, you're basically burning uh, muscle glycogen storage that is saved up for an entire marathon, an entire uh, Ironman, a half Ironman, you know, a long distance day. And once you're done, you're depleted, you're going to go to an aerobic heart rate, zone two, fat burning zone. And then that's a much slower effort, real slow. Yeah, great question, yeah, great observation. Uh, and I get really frustrated with those days when they happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Uh, Microsoft Excel and Mac and Numbers for Mac. Uh, this, I still use a lot, uh, you know, for all the gadgetry and, and apps and websites that are out there. This is, puts all the data in one place. You can identify all the relationships that exist. And it is just, like, this is uh, basically heart rate, insulin, basal bolus, uh, training stress, hours of activity, and then I graph the relationships of them o over time and I track trends. And uh, you, it's unbelievable how you see with a heat map how things are working. Do you incorporate CGM? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. So does that data go on that graph? I wish. I, I want a website that does it all. Right. right now it makes, you know, putting this stuff together a nightmare. Uh, so are your athletes entering their blood sugar? They're entering it. Some are ent entering it into training peaks into the field. There's a field. And then I can see the graphs as it tracks it through their tools, which is great. But, you know, that's a keyed in entry. Right. And, you know, I just don't get the same compliance. Uh, and then sometimes some people are um, just putting it in the notes. Uh, this, my blood sugar was this. My blood sugar was this. So, yeah. Okay. One day. One day at a time. Uh, it, it, I think back on it; just wasn't didn't seem that long ago that we had cell phones, I, I, and all this stuff is just very new. So the future of uh, go go gadgets, if you will, in, in my opinion, is that uh, we say goodbye somewhat to hardware and, and hello to software and the analysis, and we wear very small microchips and uh, low powered sensors all over our body that really communicate to one hub and then they push it all to the web and then we either have decision support systems that beam it back down and tell us how we adjust our insulin or we have healthcare professionals that get this information in real time. Uh, it's obviously only so many uh, healthcare professionals can look at all this data and make sense of it. Uh, but I do think in the future there will be a lot more automation and, and really hopefully, you know, artificial pancreas project works really well for everybody. But um, in the meantime, uh, there will be a lot more um, hardware and software, but in the very future, software, I think. So yeah, what is it you want to focus on? Because this gets a full-time, definitely a full-time job in terms of time commitment to do this stuff. Uh, heart rate. Get, get on board with heart rate. I think that that's a real big thing. Um, runners are purists about, you know, they don't like heart rate. And they just say, well, I just go for a run and it's just easier or it's just hard. Uh, but this is your window, your unique window into your physiology and what's happening. So it, that changes also over time. Metabolic cart testing is a snapshot in time of how efficient you are. So let's say you're training for a very important race that's coming up and then you take two weeks off that race you would reset to a more inefficient state. And so it's good to have testing done when you're very efficient, really fit. And then it's really good to have it done when you're not so fit so that you know what your response to your um, exercise is going to be. And you can start factoring around that. So I'm, I am working on a book. I hope that I can get this into your hands by January 1st. Uh, and it talks a little bit more about all the things that I've been talking about. But it lays out um, a methodology and a system that I've been using uh, with my athletes and myself for, for a number of years. And uh, I hope anybody who's interested, I can take your email address and let you know when it's ready. But it'll be in the, uh, in the iTunes store. We also do small uh, classes. Um, for individual athletes who want to really use the gadgets hands-on, um, swim, bike, run, and then learn how to use these adjustments. Like we can talk about it all day long, but until you know you see it in action and uh, and try it out, uh, it's hard to hard to know exactly how to do some of this stuff that I'm talking about. Is that an endless pool? It is an endless pool. Yeah, this is uh, our facility. It's, it's a weird sensation. It's, it's really neat, though. Uh, questions? Who, who's wearing a heart rate monitor right now? <laughs> will, will heart rate monitors become you know, uh, more efficient with wristbands and or other applications? I definitely think so. Uh, uh, Polar, at one point, was testing out a 
you swallow a pill and you basically have it in your digestion and it tells what your heart rate is and core temperature to a watch. I don't know at what stage they are with that, but I know I don't really like wearing my strap, but that seems a little weird. Uh, I do think that there will be better technology for that. I hope they give you a whole year supply no and you just for, leave it alone. No for that. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I just got this, uh, I don't know what brand it is, but it does it, it's a heart monitor that doesn't require a strap. This yeah. line would just always cut into me. Um, I think like 200 bucks from Neo. They just, there's a sensor on the back of it that um, just reads your heart rate. That's true. And, and you find it accurate? Yeah, yeah. There are so many great toys out there and uh, so small a budget for me, but that looks great. Uh, and they work. I mean, the, the wrist ones work. It just depends where you want that pressure on you when you're either running or biking. Is it your chest? Do you mind that? Um, or do you mind it on your wrist? And then the question is, is it waterproof? You know, the signal connectivity. Yeah, with my Garmin on one arm, because it's just a heart rate. Yeah, it's way better than getting a cheat. I'm not nearly as geeky as there's a there's a website um, that you guys can check out um, through slowtwitch.com. Do you know the name I'm thinking of? Uh, I'll get I'll get the name for you guys by the end. But other question? Yeah, DC, DC Rainmaker. Wow, in-depth reviews about gadgets. It, it's amazing. So yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Yes? Yeah, most um, physiological testing is done in universities or, um, you know, training centers. But they're growing uh, and they're popping up all over the place. So some smaller coaching organizations have them like ours. But uh, you're definitely going to find them at a place like, uh, you know, the local university that can uh, do the testing for you. Um, Try and find somebody who can do the test who is, you know, athletic and has a history. Um, that that's good for the interpretation of what your whatever your sport is that you're doing. That's really the most important part. Yeah. So I wore the mask and done the VO2 max testing where they did the gas exchange. I thought they had told me that that doesn't change so much, but it's the lactic acid test that changes. Are those? So that test, a metabolic heart test does all that as well, like what you're describing. So your lactic threshold heart rate, if you're an established athlete, won't move very much. What will change quite a bit is the pace that you run at and or the power you put out on your bike when you're riding. If you're new to endurance sports, your heart rate can change pretty dramatically. Your threshold could go higher. What you could tolerate, your endurance goes up. After about two, three years of that, it really does level out quite a bit. But lactic threshold is very different than VO2. VO2 max is the maximum output you can uh, do and maximum amount of oxygen you can take in at that time point. And is really more like a describe, describes the size of your engine, so to speak. So it's kind of funny, but when people come into test with, uh, with us um, and the results are outstanding, I'm like, wow, you know, you've got this really high VO2, it's fantastic, you should have been an Olympian. And they, they put this big, mm. <laughs> It doesn't happen that often, but every once in a while it does happen. I said, well, the good news, you know, your, your kids will be really fast, you know. <laughs> but no, that, um, how efficiently you're utilizing your, your, your fat and your carbohydrates, that changes with fitness. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And that you need to do the, because the lactic acid test is just a finger prick, like a meter. Yeah, that, that's not going to tell you anything about your economy, problems. about how, okay. how your car drives, okay. right? And the, as an example, what's really neat about metabolic car testing, it's like some people under eat carbs or they're eating too much and we're, tr we're trying to refine it so that they get into the right zone so that they're efficient and that they're healthy and that they're racing well. And I, the analogy I use, like that 2,000 calorie gas tank, it's like if you don't fill it up, you can't drive it to LA. You won't get there. Uh, whereas fat, burn as much as you like you know that's why a lot of endurance athletes in the in the base phase period uh, will do a lot of really low intensity working out like a guilt provokingly slow heart rate of like 130 beats per minute or less and that's how you get really 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 leaned out so um, can you talk 
just a little bit about your findings um, post marathon or triathlon uh, insulin resistance in the, in the muscle recovery? Yeah. Uh, after any, any complete depleted state, and I'll really say that uh, anything that's two hours or more, because really those 2,000 calories last about that long uh, if you're going really hard. If you're not going so hard, you know, e either way, you're kind of breaking the tape on empty somewhat. Uh, that lasts for about 14 hours, uh, 12 to 14 hours. But if you ate no carbohydrate, you would still be at that same depressed state for a pretty long time. I don't even know how long. Okay? Uh, I was um, doing a bike ride uh, up in the Catskills and crashed, and my pod fell off. And we were you know, hours away from getting back to New York City. And we pull into a gas station and my friend said, well, what, what are you gonna eat? And I said, give me a pile of nuts. Uh, and that was all I had to get back to New York City. So I ate nuts. But the insulin depressed need stays down um, after a race until you start to fill that tank back up. So when I look at people's basal rates, if they're at their max basal rate uh, prior to an event, I know that their glycogen storage is tap, topped off and that their gas tank is ready to go. And that's a good sign. Uh, that's, a, that's an advantage that we have as diabetics is we know and we're not going to put 17 gallons in a 16 gallon tank. So it's like, okay, cut off the carbs, good to go, go to bed, race. Yeah. yeah but one, one thing that they've done studies where in elite marathoners after a marathon because of lactic acid in the Muscle, but the muscle can't restore the glucose for a period of time until lactic acid clears out. I don't know of enough elite type, uh, type 1 marathoners to tell you enough about that. Okay. I just don't know, but it's definitely possible. I find after major events that I do or what our athletes do that um, their sensitivity lasts about as long as the mic. <laughs> as long as the mic, yeah. Um, about 12 to 14 hours, generally speaking. And then it just keeps climbing back up until you get to that basal rate, that max basal rate. So I'll pass that to you. One last question, anybody? Yeah. What if you don't, have any, don't notice any sensitivity? After? It would say that you're very efficient. Very efficient. And you could be as efficient all the way up into your threshold. So that's why testing is so important because I have people who are, have uh, very high um, VO2 maxes and their body is so efficient that when they're running all out, it's, they're still burning 70% uh, fat, which is tremendous. They can go, go and go and go and go. Maybe one of those, it's hard to say. But um, usually if, if sensitivity is not the issue, um, that's what I find. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I hope, hope uh, you enjoyed it. Learned a few things. Thanks very much.